<laughs> it's book eight of Herodotus, the final one of our um, trio that we need to look at. Um, and it's the 23rd, 24th and 25th Logos, starting with the Battle of Artemisium. Uh, you'll remember that at the end of Book 7, Leonidas has been killed. Uh, Xerxes has been victorious in inverted commas at the Battle of Thermopylae. And at the start of Book 8, uh, eight we learn that whilst Leonidas has been busy on land holding the gates of uh, the hot gates at Thermopylae, Themistocles has been keeping the Greek force at Artemisium to hold the Persian fleet away. And we discover, uh, really, as Themistocles comes into deeper focus in Book 8, how he works, some of his attributes and his elements. Remember at the start of Book 8, the way Themistocles keeps the Greek forces at Artemisium is he takes a bribe from the island of Euboea. The Euboeans don't want the Greek fle fleet to sail away because obviously they suspect that they'll then be, um, be um, sacked by the, uh, the Persians. And um, so they uh, offer 30 talents to, uh, to ask the Greeks to stay. Themistocles cunningly gives five talents to Euripides, the Spartan commander, and, um, and he gives three talents to Adamantus, the Corinthian commander. Three plus five equals eight. But he wasn't he given 30? Eight from... Hmm. There's 22 talents that has just not quite been accounted for. I wonder who kept that. Anyway... Um, the battle, which does take place, is indecisive. The Greeks are able to kind of hold off the Persians. They don't get defeated, which is probably in itself a key victory. And a number of Persian ships are shipwrecked, trying to sail around Euboea. And uh, as the Persian army advances and the Greek navy retreats, Themistocles gets his men to carve messages into the rocks where the Persians are going to put in to draw water in an attempt to unsettle the Ionians in the Persian fleet. And Herodotus tells this really nicely. He, he says he, he thinks there are a couple of reasons why this could happen. One is that maybe it'll make the Ionians come, come back over onto the Greek side. The other is maybe it will sow the seeds of doubt into the minds of the Persians about whether the Ionians can truly be trusted. Um, and actually that's, that shows the, 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 the cunning of Themistocles, doesn't it? It doesn't matter whether the Ionians do come over to the Greek side. All that matters is that Xerxes now feels they can't be trusted. So the Battle of Artemisium is um, indecisive, 480 BC still. Um, and we move on to the Battle of Salamis. Now, when the Greeks get back down to Salamis, the island just off Athens, there's an argument about what should happen. Most of the Greeks, especially those from the Peloponnese, want to retreat to the Isthmus of Corinth build a wall there and defend themselves. Themistocles doesn't want to do that because clearly that would mean surrendering um, both Athens and also the island of Salamis, and that's where most of the population of Athens have retreated. So he says, basically, it's a terribly bad idea. Adamantus disagrees with him and tells him that because he hasn't got a city, he shouldn't have a say. And Themistocles says, well, fine, if we haven't got a city, we'll all go to Italy and see how you get on without us. The Athenians make up around half of the, of the Greek navy, so you can see where the power of the persuasion comes. But whilst the Greeks are still kind of hovering and hedging about what they should do, Themistocles pushes the issue forward by sending his house slave, Sakinas, to Xerxes to say, oh, do you know the Greeks are trying to escape? And they're going to try and retreat around the island of Salamis. This brings Xerxes in to try and block the Greeks in, um, and it then triggers the battle. The Greeks are victorious by staying in the narrows and the shallows, allowing the bigger and more cumbersome Persian navy to come into the to the straits at Salamis, and then it's easier for them to be picked off. Um, and the Greeks are victorious um, heroically, despite being outnumbered three to one. At this point, Xerxes begins to get worried that he's going to be trapped in Greece. Um, Herodotus suggests that actually he's frightened, he's scared. Um, and so he wants to retreat, and he accepts Mardonius's suggestion that perhaps a, an occupying army should be left behind, which can mop up the Greek forces, while Xerxes himself returns home. Once Xerxes has gone, Mardonius, in the winter of 480-479 BC, sends Alexander of Macedon to make peace with Athens, uh, and he makes a peace offer, but the Athenians reject him. 
And this will lead ultimately in 479 to the Battle of Plataea, when the Greek alliance, led by the Spartans on this occasion, um, fight the Persians at the Battle of Plataea and defeat them. According to Herodotus, on the same day, uh, a, a Greek naval force, um, mainly led by Athenians, lands in Asia Minor at Mycale and destroys the Persian navy, and thus it kind of puts an end to, to, uh, to the war. And uh, my best quotes from Book 8. This neutrality, if I may speak frankly, equated to collaboration with the Medes. Here we have Herodotus's view of what it's like if you don't pull your socks up and take part. You can't just be neutral. And this concept of Medizing is really important. The Greek alliance is made up of a, quite a small number of states led by Athens, Sparta, Corinth, um, and also having um, the assistance of one or two others, such as Plataea. Many other Greek states, which end up kind of going for, well, we'll be neutral. Herodotus says that's not really an excuse, and he is not afraid to condemn them for really basically not pulling their weight. Um, and so as a result, um, remember that for Medizing, neutrality is as bad as participation. Remember the Battle of Salamis. My men have become women, and my women men. This is a story of Artemisia, who, uh, who, although um, she's actually in a, in a slightly dodgy incident, she, she runs down and rams one of her own ships in order to escape an Athenian um, ship. Um, the distance to where Xerxes is is so far that Xerxes and his advisor are mistaken. They think Artemisia has run down a Greek ship. So whilst Artemisia is apparently being successful, the rest of the Persian fleet are being defeated. And so Xerxes makes his comment, my men have become women, my women men. A useful quote because one, it shows Herodotus's sympathy for uh, Artemisia, who's from Halicarnassus' hometown. So even though she's a Persian, she gets a positive write-up from him. Secondly, it shows um, Xerxes' uh, dismissal of his own side and his anger. And thirdly, it picks up on this theme of the, the sort of feminine nature of the Persians, whereas the masculine Greeks are victorious. And it's part of that kind of view that actually the Greeks and the Persians are quite different in, in some ways, despite their other similarities. Um, and then there's this final stirring passage at the end of Book 8, which I really have come to like a lot. Um, when Alexander of Macedon comes to the Athenians, he says, why don't you join us? The Athenians don't take part. Their initial response um, to Mardonius is, or to, to Alexander of Macedon is, for as long as the sun holds to its current course, we shall never come to terms with Xerxes. We shall still defend ourselves to the very limits of our ability. We shall never change our minds. Um, and so basically what they say is, clear off. And then the Spartans come scurrying around going, ooh, 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 were you, you, you going to give up on us? Were you going to give up on us? And the Athenians say this, which I think encapsulates what it's like to be a Greek fighting the Persians and how Herodotus wants to explain the victory of the Greeks. We are all of us Greeks of one blood and one tongue, united by the temples that we have raised for the gods and by the way we offer them sacrifice and by the customs that we have in common. That's what the Greeks are fighting for. They're fighting for their sense of uh, their own identity, their customs and their gods. It's not about a political system. It's not about a particular goal or an aim. It's this idea that they are united around a, a sense of Greekness, which is quite new in the 5th century BC, but nevertheless is something that is recognisable. And I think that, if you're going to take that away uh, as, as a key point, is one of the absolute fundamental bedrocks of how Herodotus sees things. It's actually about the fact that those who fought were fighting for common cause, surrounded and underpinned by a desire to be Greek and not to be enslaved. And it goes right back to the start of book six. Are we to be slaves or are we to be free? And that is the essential message of Herodotus.